Hey, Gabriel Blake. Hey, Gabriel Jose. Where are we today? Today, we are sitting completely unvaccinated at our own homes, like the last 11 months. <laughs> The uh, it's so weird to actually think that we are close to the one year mark, and it's funny because it's like this is a social construct that we say that it's like a year is something, you know, but it's it becomes like something a bit heavier when you think about like a year ago we started to record this podcast and we were in some diverse and diverse. That's true. Long. Like the podcast is turning a year old right now. Probably, yeah. I need to check the, uh, the specific date, but exactly one year ago, I was in New York thinking about moving there. Wow. Yeah. Time How flies. time flies when there's a global pandemic. Exactly. When you cannot leave your house. <laughs> but yeah, what did, <laughs> what did we watch this time? We watched the 2003 Russian... I don't even know how to describe this. A Russian film. That's how we'll describe it. <laughs> the Return by Andrei Zvyagintsev. Wow. Uh, let me just ask you something. Do you have this press seat open? Uh, I do. Do you want me? But it's on a... No. Okay, you don't check it. I'm going to be like writing don't down... Don't my... yeah, 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 don't check it. I'm, I'm writing down my score. And this was your pick. So that you can't change it. Yeah, well, I mean, I may change it, but probably not. Uh, what did you pick it? What did we watch last week, since I can't look at the... Frank. Spreadsheet. Yeah, we watched Frank. I think I wanted, like... Frank was a little bit too light, you know, just examining serious mental illness and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I Honestly, I, you and I love to talk about Loveless, how much we both, like... I wouldn't say adored because it's a very brutal film, but we both like really like that film. Yep. Remind me, did you see Leviathan? Yeah, I did. I did. And I actually had to check the express it because I thought that we that I watched it because of the podcast, but no, I watched it with a friend in Spain. I just ran over and said, Oh, Leviathan. He said, Oh yeah, it's from the director of Loveless. I want to watch this. So we had both seen those two movies. I think we liked Leviathan. We loved Loveless. We keep referencing it. The way that I got introduced to this director was watching this film. I think it was in a Russian language class when I was in college. And I had I had spent two years living in Russia and I was like, wow, this is like what life is in Russia. So I, I just wanted you to see his first film. Um, I think, and we'll talk about this further, this director like is incredible. And so I was very interested in seeing his first feature length film and hearing what you thought about it. So that's why I picked it. Yeah, uh, and I could say that we talk from time to time about the style of a director, if he's like subtle, or it's a bit more like heavy handed. Like for example, for Mike League, we were talking about like, it's pretty subtle, it could have been directed by anyone else, but it has been like directed perfectly. You know, with this guy, it's like pretty clear. It's like, it's his movie. <laughs> it's 100% from the same director as Leviathan and Loveless. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm thinking that it's like just having like a very visual language, you know, like very clean visual language. It's, it's good. It's like a really good thing. Um, so for the summary, so basically it's like this is two hours. I'm going to be like first doing like a very high level kind of summary. This is two hours of a father that doesn't have like the tools for being a father trying to rise <laughs> you know trying to reconnect with the kids that he left behind 12 years ago and just failing at it basically that but then if we go over the summary uh, the movie opens you know a bit more of the tale summary the movie opens with two siblings uh two young kids i don't know the age if he's like what like 14 and 12 or a bit older 15 and 13. Ivan, the younger one has never met the dad, so I'm guessing he's 12. And then, um, is it Andre? The older one, Andre, I think yeah. it's like 14-ish. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're trying to, they're like jumping from a tower 
and uh, the younger one gets afraid of jumping while well, jumping to the water from a tower. And, yeah, uh, you're not killing them. Yeah, they're not killing themselves. Yeah, and uh, the young one gets afraid and he just like probably for some vertigo or something, and he just stays behind. The mother comes back and just like reassures him about like, no, I'm here. Don't worry. The kids is like, I would have died if you hadn't come. And he's like, no, no, you're absolutely fine. And then a couple of scenes later, the father comes back. It's pretty clear the mother has been erasing both of them for many years, but the father just suggests to just go on a trip fishing. That is supposed to be like just taking a couple of days, but it ends up taking a week. I think the whole story takes like a week from the beginning to the end. Pretty close to that. They're... The father extends the trip by like four days beyond when the mom was expecting them home. Yeah, and this is before mobile phones or anything, so it's like all the communications are mostly asynchronous. Um, yeah, or pay phones, you know, like going to a restaurant and then just call it from the phone. In rural and, Russia. Yeah, and I was going to say is that everything is like pretty allegorical. I like that you pick this movie from the perspective that we have watched other movies that like the marriage of sorry the marriage of Maria Brown that you can say is like oh Fassbinder is like trying to represent Germany here with these characters is that this is the same kind of situation you could actually just think about like this story that you're seeing about like a absent father coming back trying to reconnect with the kids and at the same time he's trying to do like some uh, on the side business taking them to some island and then doing something like pretty weird that I this is the part that I don't like that is like just unearthing or just like surfacing some kind of treasure that we never know what that is, but like basically using the kids as an excuse for doing this trip, basically. And, uh, or you could just interpret it as something more, something about like we, we have seen in Leviathan or we have seen in Loveless, we have seen about like this about Russia, the father. Is Russian. <laughs> I'm the father of Russia. Yeah, I don't. So I'll say that when I saw this the first time, I didn't have the I don't know the awareness to be like this is a sat like not a satire, but it's a commentary on Russia. And this time I was like, well, I've seen Leviathan. I know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, and with Loveless too. And with Loveless, we have to say that he was not soft leader because the last scene with the woman. It's like just running on the treadmill with the teaser that says Russia. <laughs> that is like, okay, okay, I get it. I get it. They are Russia. The pirates are Russia. And they're like just giving like, fuck you to the kids. And uh, on this one, I felt like the same kind of way. Okay, it's like your father has been absent and you guys don't have the correct kind of any role model in your life. And it's like the, the younger kid, I fucking hate that kid. He's and it's just this. He's a dick, but it's, like, it's, it's also at the same time, it's that like you didn't have any kind of role model and your mother has spoiled you. She has been there for just calling you, just protecting you from things that they were not a danger. You know, when the kid says, like, oh, I would have died. Any mother in her common sense will say, like, no, you wouldn't. You're just sitting here. There is nothing. There is no risk to you. But I'm going to be like calling you, don't worry, mommy's here now. You know, that is a just emphasizing a bit more about how the range these kids are and the other one that is a bit better and he tries to just connect with the uh, with the father he's incomplete basically a bit more of a well, I, would, I would describe him as like the literal definition of pathetic like he's desperate <laughs> for the love and approval of this man that essentially abandoned him and it's embarrassing to watch him be so desperate for this man's affection and this man has no affection to give so it's even more embarrassing to watch yeah and i don't mean like you'll cringe it's just honestly kind of tragic to see okay. this relationship yeah, yeah yeah i mean that's that's what i like about it from the perspective that the father doesn't have the tools but the kids doesn't have the tools for loving either is that everything is like just so broken on the screen the whole time that it's just painful to watch. And there was something that I like, and I know that I'm just going towards like if I like this movie or not. I did. I, uh, but it's like how, uh, how do you say, like defenseless you feel about the kids. 
the just they're just at the mercy of the father. If the father would be like, okay, I'm peace with you, I'm going to be like just dropping you here in the middle of nowhere. It's like unless I change my mind, you will die. He's like and he, he abandons them like is it three yeah. times? He just drives away and it's like do what you want. Yep, yep, I'm done with you, or just go back in the uh, in the bus, back to your hometown, I don't care. Is it okay? I oh, never mind, get off the bus, we are going to go fishing. It, yep. It's like so abusive, relationship, yep. it's so abusive. Yeah, it's like, it makes you feel not only like bad about the kids, but also bad about, I don't know, I mean, it almost like just transport me into the idea of when you're a kid, you're at the mercy of adults. But yeah, I, I completely agree. Oh, please. I was going to say, like, but the interesting part, and just jumping, let me just summarize the rest of it. Spoilers come. When they go to this island, you know, for fishing, where there is this treasure that we never know what it is, uh, the father dies in very tragic circumstances. Well, tragic, stupid circumstances. Uh, and then they carry the body back into the car. Well, they try to take it back to the car, to the mainland, and they drive away. That it also represents that is a, they were not so defenseless, they were not so in despair. Is that they could have actually just figured out things, but they were just saying about like Russia will provide until Russia is no longer there, and they have to figure out things about themselves. Sorry, I say like Russia wanted to say the father. <laughs> Um, so again, I, I completely agree with everything you said. I, I, I think you'll agree the film is about the impact of having a father or not having a father or the abusiveness of a father and clearly the father's Russia. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to do that. Um, but I will say that I have lived in Russia and I've lived in rural towns like that and it's exactly that. It's the men leave or they're just not present because they're alcoholics and oh god this sounds like such generalization but this is what i experienced there aren't strong fathers in their their children's lives and what i particularly liked about the relationship between the two boys is that they've they clearly grew in a very authentic way to lean on each other in the absence of their father's lives in the absence of their father and they've tried to toughen each other up while at the same time like protecting each other it's it's a very sweet and natural bond and while we don't get a ton of character development because the the film takes place over the seven days you don't see what happened before you don't see what happened after um I felt like it was a very sincere and authentic examination, both of this metaphor of Russia has treated people, its children, like shit, and also in more of a real sense of do we care about these characters, do we believe these characters and their motivations? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that, that it's, like, it's pretty believable. I have never been in Russia, you know, but there was this joke that I had with a friend that if you see someone like risking their lives for something stupid, it's a Russian. <laughs> so I, I remember that he mentioned it when we were in uh, Yosemite, and I don't know if you have ever been in Yosemite, but they have like a couple of waterfalls that are like pretty iconic. And there is like a, you know, like pretty well marked road that you shouldn't leave but there are like some people that they leave, they get into the water, you know, and if you lead and the water takes you away, it's like you will fall from this uh, from the uh, waterfall and you will die for sure. So the time that I went there with this friend is that there were a group of people that they were standing on the last rock in front of the fall. You know, it's a bit more it's like if you slide into the water, you die. If you slide into the rock, you die. It's like everything. It's going to, you are like just risking your life for something stupid. There were like a group of Russian people there. Yeah, so uh, Russians, because the, it's it's like the Wild West out there, man. There's like, there are police, but like, you're really just, you have to protect yourself. So a lot of the insane dash cam footage you see on the internet, it all comes from Russia, all of it, because they try <laughs> no. to insane, there's no regulations. And yeah, it, it's a different, it's just very different. Yes, they seem to be reckless. They seem to value their own lives less than other people's do, which 
is interesting because the Soviet Union pounded into them that the, the well-being of the state far outweighs the well-being of the individual. And huh. we could go into like example after example when the um, when the uh, when that group of terrorists, domestic terrorists, took over that theater in in Russia in the nineties, mm. uh, and it was so embarrassing to the Russian state that they pumped in a ton of gas, too much gas, and it, it made everyone pass out, including the people who were being held hostage. And the government was so proud that when they got the people out, they wouldn't tell the doctors what gas they used, so they couldn't give them the cure. And they just let all those people die. It wasn't the terrorists that killed them; it was the Russian government, because it was way more important to show that as as a state, Russia is in full control. And I actually wrote a paper about this in my senior year about this like value system. Russians learn that they are less valuable than the state, and you see that to this day. There's no value on like the human life. It's just we are a world power. We have nuclear weapons. We are strong. That's all that's important. Honestly, out of all the countries in the world, I would rather go to North Korea before going to Russia. So I'll say that I spent two years in Russia, and then two years later I got sent there for work, a different area of Russia, but Russia. Have I told you this story? I don't think that you ever told me that you go back, that you went back. I did, yeah. So I went to Samara and Novosibirsk doing um, economic impact studies with a microfinance organization. Not Kiva, but one I worked for before called Finca, okay. Finca International. It's an amazing organization. Check it out. But um, I flew from my home to Dulles, I think, Washington, D.C., to catch a flight to Moscow. And I had the closest thing that I've ever experienced to a nervous breakdown. And I was 21, like a full-grown adult, and I'm a big guy. I'm six three and like 250 <laughs> pounds, and okay. I was just sobbing in the airport, like, but like, like embarrassing. Oh, just going back. Yeah, and I called my mom, and I was like, I don't want to go back to Russia. I don't. And she was so freaked out. She's like, just get on the first flight home. They'll understand. Don't worry. Ultimately, I got on the plane, but I. That was the first time I realized how traumatized I was from living two years in St. Petersburg. Uh, it's a dark, 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 dark place to be. It's just dark. Okay, you're scaring me, you know? <laughs> I don't know how you're describing it. I was like, if any, if any of our five listeners are from Russia, run away. That's the only thing, you know, after just seeing movies from this director, and what you're telling me is like there is there is nothing i'm sorry there's it, it feels hopeless it really does and and to be fair the friends that i still talk to there they say the economy has picked up things are very different i was there in 2003 four five and then again in seven yeah. um so i don't know what it's like but as a 19 year old boy it just really fucked me up wow man that's that is for sure man that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, so yeah, I did I miss anything that is key to the movie? I mean, I already mentioned that the the father dies by climbing this this tower. This I mean, I don't know exactly how to define it, but it's like very precarious tower that is in the middle of this island. Yeah, I think the only thing I would point out that I think is significant is that Ivan was terrified of heights. That's why he couldn't jump at the beginning. It's why the father took Andre up to the top of this tower a few days before and he refused to go because he's terrified of heights and then I think it's fairly significant that he overcame his fears to escape his father and that's ultimately what caused his death. I don't know what Zyagenso was trying to say with that. I suspect I do. Uh, what was he trying to say then? I think he was trying to say that the Russian people are stronger than their abusive father tells them they are. And that if they just, you know, stand up for themselves and say, fuck you, you're an abusive asshole that's not really doing anything for me, you can overcome. Yeah, and what I was, I, I agree with that, but at the same time is I was thinking about all those Russians in Yosemite, you know, like risking their lives for just impressing girls. And I was thinking, is that, no, I think that they're fine. You know? <laughs> They can overcome anything. They don't fucking care about anything. But no, I, I think that you're right. But at the same time, the part that I'm a bit more confused about the message of this movie is that who is the mother? 
who the mother represents. You know, it's a bit more about like the Western world. I don't know, to be honest, and it, and it had me thinking a lot. So when I was there, um, every every woman I wrote of a certain age, maybe 35, 35, 40 or older, how to say this? There are no old men in Russia, none. Stalin killed every last one. So there are tons and tons of old women. They call them babushki or like grandma, oh, yeah. but there are just no men anywhere. So this entire country has been so influenced by a lack of a male presence that the women almost become invisible. Like there's just so many of them and they do everything. They're the ones that work. They're the men just are either not there or they're drunk. So I think that the fact that the mother was a non-entity isn't significant in any way besides this is kind of the norm. Mothers get pushed to the side. When the man comes to town, he gets to be in charge, even if it's for the first time in 12 years. I don't know. Yeah. yeah but at the same time, it's like there is a bit of a, I don't know, like under the lines or between the lines message that is that the younger kid is they pretty clear that he has been spoiled you know he has like this idea of what is right and what is wrong and this idea of toxic masculinity that he abuses of because it's true that the older kid is a bit more of a ass kisser you know but like desperate for approval and desperate for the you know like the the role model of a father but the younger kid is a He's a pain the whole time. He's a bit more of the, oh, you're asking me about doing something, so I'm going to be like complaining all the time. Do you think there's anything to their ages? Because the difference between 12 and 14, and I'm not a father, but I was a 12 year old boy and a 14 year old boy, I feel like to me it was more interesting to be like, oh, the older son is a little bit more mature with his emotions and the younger son is just a bitter piece of shit that's been coddled by his mother. Mm -hmm. uh, and so neither one of them are really likable, but I found their reactions to their father's presence. They were so different that it was interesting to watch. Um, and again, I didn't like either of them and Yvonne was particularly unsufferable, insufferable, just unacceptable. Yvonne was the oldest one? the younger one the, the oh brat. yeah definitely definitely i will agree on that but i think that it's not only about the age it's also about like just being the younger and the older and the oldest you know yeah i agree i agree but and th there's that interesting scene at the beginning where there there's a friend group jumping off into the water from the heights um and you can see andre wants to protect his his younger brother while also desperately seeking the approval of his friends okay. yeah and ultimately he abandons him in that moment which is what he does with his father because yvonne puts up a boundary he's like i'm not going to connect with my father but andre is desperate to do so and because andre and yvonne have this strong bond andre pulls away from yvonne and i think that like that adds to Yvonne's abandonment issues because his father abandoned him and now his brother is. No, that's good. Yeah, I didn't think about it. That's a good point. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes back to where they're playing soccer and he started like, just being like violent about like, I need to just also find the approval that you were looking for. I need yes. to just bring my masculinity to them. So they've had to like combine these like needs they have. They need somebody to teach them to be tough, but they need someone to care for them. And these brothers don't have anyone. So they try to be all of those things for each other. And it's just very, it's not just functional. It's just, it's sad and incomplete. They don't have everything they need, even though they're yeah. trying to provide them. Yeah. I mean, the thing is like, I don't, I don't know if they're trying to provide it, you know, is that they don't know. They're like, yes they're like just missing a North Star. There is yeah, no role model <laughs> in the front. It's like the father, I don't think that the father is like trying to be evil per se. It's like, like several times that you can just find honest love in him for his kids, for his kids. But at the same time, it's like, it's, it's incomplete. It's like you are like just the result of your parents having the same issues with you. Do you, you saw American Psycho, right? No. Okay, we'll fix that. Um, but <laughs> is it good? So, is it honestly it's good? It's not great, but it's worth watching once. Okay. But I will say Christian Bale plays an American Psycho, 
and wait, bodies wait. start to bodies start to pile up around him, and a policeman, an investigator who's played by Willem Dafoe, kind of you know starts to sniff around. The director asked Willem Dafoe to take turns playing scenes where one, he's absolutely convinced Christian Bale is the killer, two, he's undecided, and three, he's absolutely convinced that Christian Bale is innocent. So you just see these scenes and it's just such a different experience that you're like, what the hell is going on? Because I don't understand. That's what I felt like uh, Zviagintsev told the father because he was alternately like rude, like physically abusive, and then other times when Ivan loses a bowl on purpose, he's like, I lost a bowl. And he's like, don't worry, I'm going to teach you how to make one out of birch. Yep. And it's like, what the? <laughs> what the I couldn't figure out what the, what the dad's motivations were, what he actually wanted to do with these kids. Do you think the dad actually cared about the kids? I think he did. Well, I think that he did, I think that partially he did, but at the same time, I think that he was self-aware that he was not prepared to be a father. That he didn't know how to be a good father. Like he was do you like, think like his behavior was trying to like compensate for his understanding that he's not prepared to do this? I think that instead of actually thinking about like what a good person would be, he would be more thinking about like who I am, who am I? You know? Because when he leaves them and then he actually keeps thinking about like, oh, well, we don't see if he is thinking or not, but like he comes back, is a he doesn't really miss them. And they even realize that you don't need us. Is it no father needs their kids? Is that they can be they can remain a human being with other kids. Uh, he disappeared for twelve years. But is I think that there is genuine love for them. And I will say, that if it's not clear from our conversation, it's not that he didn't visit them for 12 years. They had no interaction, like none. So like Ivan isn't even convinced he's their real dad. He's like, what proof do we have? We don't know this man at all. Um, well, but the mother does. I mean, well, I think that they that's her dad. But I feel like that's another, like, the government saying, oh, this is your father, you need to listen to this person. Well, but that's the reason why they actually go to look for the picture when they're still at the house and they see a picture of Andre as a, as a newborn and the other kid as a... But we don't find that to the very end, right? No, 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 they have it also in the uh, basement or attic. Oh, in the attic, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's that they actually have that picture too. They have the same copy. I mean, they have a copy of the same picture. I don't know who has the original, but it's, it's pretty clear that it was important for the father. But it's that the father, we also assume that he has been in some shady businesses we're you not know. told that, but it definitely seems that way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He goes a lot of times, you know, to some other people. He goes to pick up some stuff. It's pretty clear. At that some he point, he picks up a package that's shaped like a body, but we'd never find out in I, that. I thought that one was the engine for the boat. For the boat. Was it? I, it could have been. I might have missed it, but I was like. Uh, so I will say that we see the father exclusively through the eyes of the boys. We don't learn anything about him that isn't observed by them. So as a viewer of the film, we are constantly guessing who is this guy? Is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? We don't know. Well, we know that he's not good. Well, I mean, he well, the you know, died to save his son, so... Save the song. I mean, the song is not going to be like jumping or anything. I mean, the, the, the song is actually just threatening from jumping. If he goes up, and he actually goes up. Yeah, I see your point, but I also <laughs> think Andre told the father he's afraid of heights, and this kid, this 12 year old kid climbs. How, how high would you say it is? It's like 50 or 60 feet. It's not it's like a treehouse or something. It's fucking scary. That ladder. The ladder, the first time that they climb, is like, someone is going to die here. This is pretty clear. Someone is going to die in this tower. It's yeah, just it feels very unnerving watching it. It feels like a Russian thing. After <laughs> what I was saying about like the, the guys in Yosemite, like, this feels like something designed by Russians for Russians. About like, one of you is going to die. But you don't care about your life, so just go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. I. I feel like you're probably given enough evidence as a viewer of the film to make a call about what you think is happening with that guy, but ultimately we don't know. We we never learn his motivations, what he's been doing the last 12 years. We're not told any of it. 
Yeah, that's true. And I appreciate, you know, I'm fine with the idea of, okay, let, just a little bit vague is fine. But what I fucking hate about this movie is the idea of the treasure that he unearths. I don't know what is the term about like just... You can you know, say unearthed for sure, or you can say dug up. Dug up, yeah. He actually does up, but it's like we never know exactly what was in there. Is that it actually goes down with the boat. But it is such a, a stupid thing that is like, why do you need this? Why? Yeah, I think it would have been stronger without that because literally if you take that scene out, it wouldn't take away from the film at all. And it doesn't no. contribute for sure. I, I didn't get it. If there was some kind of ulterior motive for showing that for just that arc, I didn't get it at all. It's, it was lost on me. I'm so and curious I, if, if it's ever been revealed. I take a couple of, uh, of pages, no one has said anything, no. I mean, you may find something, but it's like, I just feel like, what the fuck was in that box at the end? I said, no, no one said anything. And I, I found like, this is so gratuitous, but it's, like, it's not adding anything. You could have left it about, like, they went to this island. He knew about this island, they went there, and they had a great time until the father died. And I would have been like exactly the same way. I could have like a director's cut, well, not the director, because I'm pretty sure this was like from the director, but it's like without these parts, I would have been exactly the same way. Unless, unless he's trying to say something about Russia, about like he's always trying to come back to the old age of splendor that they're always hidden. And we are never going to be like getting there. It's impossible for us getting there. But it could be as simple as uh, the father, whatever he represents, doesn't really care about you. He's using you as an excuse to go to this island to dig up what he buried. But what you were saying is that people actually in Russia, they still think that the country is more important than themselves. And it's... They... Go ahead. No, and I was going to say is that at the country at the same time, they are still looking back about like the old age of richness that they used to have. And they may try to use their, their kids in order to get back to that. So everything you're saying is true. And it's interesting because all of these, you know, middle-aged women who said, who told me personally that life was better for them during the USSR, they also each had a story about how the um, the KGB came and took one of their uncles at a family dinner and nobody ever saw him again. So it's just this very interesting, like loving your abuser, right? Like, oh, the government like took away my grandpa, my dad and my brother and I never saw them again, but at least I, I have food it. on the table. Yeah. So I've been more of an Estochol syndrome I hadn't thought about it this way until now, but now I'm like, the metaphor is kind of clear. I don't know. I want to read an interview with this director and see how much of my own shit I'm projecting onto this film because I also had a dad who left when I was 12, so. <laughs> okay. right. that, that's fair. That's completely fair, but it's like, I think that there is like more to this here. He's like, imagine that your father left, I mean, your father left when you were younger and then there is no communication with him. Nothing, zero, for 12 years. And then he has already comes back and he's like, everything is back to normal. Want to go on a fishing trip? It's my blowing. It's my blowing. It's like, if I was the mother, it's like, I, you are not getting close to my kids. And it's true that it's like, Russia is a bit more of an abusive kind of society for women. And that is like, yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you have been like just raising them for 12 years. I have a dick and you don't. And she's been telling them that he's a pilot for the government and filling their stories with what a hero he is. So I will say that you mentioned earlier on that as you watch this, you're like, yes, this is an Andres Vyagensev film. I will say that I expected it to be a little bit sloppier than Loveless because it was his first film. But and nice. I do think Loveless is better. But this, as a first film, the pacing, the cinematography, I was just blown away by this. And I was completely impressed by how well he captures landscapes. I don't know how well you remember oh, yeah. Leviathan, but it's just like 
nobody can make the world look like this. Leviathan looks better. Leviathan, but I think they say because because of the uh, old landscape that he works with. But it's a Leviathan. I remember like just being mind blown by it. About like, holy shit, is that this exist? Oh, but it exists in Russia, so it doesn't really exist. I'm never going to be like seeing this, but it's like holy shit, this is good, you know. But this one is good too, you know. It's like all the scenes where they are on the island. It's true that a part of me, when the kids are like just walking through this uh, cornfield, I mean, I don't think there is corn, and they're saying, like, Oh, is this truly an island? And the other kid is like, Yeah, I actually went up there. It's like there is water all around. It's like it's hard to believe about like how diverse that landscape is. But I think that, and this is something interesting about the director of about Andre, that is like he loves and hates what Russia is. You mean the dad? What the dad is? <laughs> well, I'm talking about like a bit more about like, no, no. the no, no. aspect, you know, yeah. about like he knows about like from the society perspective about like how sick this is, but at the same time about like how gorgeous it is. Is that there is like a love to it, and also I don't know how you feel about this, but he loves to use these cold colors kind of filter in the cinematography. Yeah, everything was like bluish gray or yellow when they were not on the yeah. island when they were yeah. yeah yeah he's a little bit more heavy-handed here um and a little bit less strong but that's not to say this is a weak film at all it's better than most films i think oh yeah definitely and for just being like his first film and i'm surprised i didn't check about that but it's like he only has like five films five and this being the first one is like that's amazing. That all the elements that you have here, I can see it in Leviathan. I can see it in Loveless. It's... So I have heard. So he has two films that you and I have not seen: The Banishment and Elena. And I've heard they're both incredible. Um, so oh. because we loved, I would, to be honest, I was lukewarm about Leviathan. I didn't connect emotionally with it, but Loveless mm. and The Return. And I'm like, I will watch everything this guy puts out. Everything. Why didn't you connect with Leviathan? What was missing from you? So I'm having a hard time remembering the story, but as I recall, it's about a man or a family who owns some land and a house that's important to his family, and the government wants to take it yeah. away to yeah. build a road or something, make a dam. Um, and they want to actually just yes, keep... Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you tell me. No, 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 no. I, I was going to say this. And the only thing is like they want to build there. They want to do like something that is a bit more of a touristy kind of thing. It's a bit more like, about progress. More than so I think, I think why I couldn't connect with it is because it's like a man versus this faceless, enormous enemy, which is the government, right? Like, I just, I didn't leave that movie feeling like wow i really felt something that's the only thing it's beautiful i could tell it was good but i it's not one of my favorite films yeah. well i mean it actually has a face it's the major of the city and he basically just fucks him over and over and over until they destroy the house and it's like the moment when they actually destroy the house is like god you have to go there it's like it's true it has been like just one shot that you had to do with that but it's like is is powerful that's a powerful movie it is they're all powerful i i just i can't believe that when i think of my when i think of the directors i think are putting out the best work in the last 20 25 years this guy should come to my head like among the first it should be like quentin tarantino uh kelly reichardt andres regensev i mean he's up there with yeah. the best filmmakers today yeah and I, I and I agree with you about like just mentioning Quentin Tarantino from the perspective that his first movie was one of his best. It has been like a bit more up and down, you know, but it's like Reservoir Dogs for Quentin Tarantino is is amazing. It's like it's almost like when you have like very limited budget, you do your best. And I, I did say almost I thought like we... I thought a lot about um about our discussion about how when directors we love are like young and edgy, we tend to like their films more than when they finally get the the critical acclaim, like Steve McQueen and 12 Years a Slave. Like, yeah. he should have fucking won an Oscar for Hunger and Shame, but whatever. I thought that 
Like, yeah. yeah, this is a little bit more gritty. I think Loveless is almost a perfect film, which is his last film released in 2017. But I prefer him in a little bit more of a sloppy way where he's just kind of, this is who I am, this is how I feel. Yeah, I mean, the only part of that is like, I think that you still need maturity is that that part about the treasure, if it's like you're like less focused. Yeah, yep. This is just like you're trying to be like, I, I'm going to be like doing a lot of stuff and all of the stuff is going to be like coming together at the end. Like, and that part doesn't. I almost like just detract from the overall kind of experience that is like, wh why did you add that? Like, there is no point to add that. I agree. And I am absolutely certain there's a different version of the script where we find out what was in that. And then the director was like, you know what would be great if we left people wondering? Let's not give them the answers they want. Then they'll think about the movie. <laughs> and I know that makes the film sound Jeez. stupid, but that's what I that's yeah, that's what I think happened. But but look, that's the interesting part is that I was checking online after watching it about like hey, what is the genre the genre for this movie? And it was like drama mystery. I say like, the only mystery on this is that box nothing else is a mystery nothing else really matters it's like it's, it's not really a mystery we don't care it's not important what the father went away I, or why came back this is the first thing i disagree with you about because to me the father is a huge mystery we never get any answers yvonne's not even convinced that he's their real dad and i started to believe yvonne like we know nothing about who this guy is what he wants he is a mystery, but maybe that's because my own father is a mystery. <laughs> okay. That's pretty deep and personal. But honestly, for just enjoying what is happening on the screen, it doesn't really matter. Is that you can just remove the idea of how Andre outing the father being the father. It's because he's used to actually just the coin of the mother is that this guy here that he showed up is that he has a power over me and he's not calling me i'm used to something to someone to actually just treat me as i'm special and i'm not you know so for him it, that doesn't really matter like he could have like a 23 and me proof in front of him telling that that's your father yeah he'd be like he's not treating me as what i expect my father to treat me and I would argue that that is actually an indicator of how strong the film is because I disliked everybody in this movie. The boys are, are you know, spoiled, the dad is mean, the mom doesn't seem to care about her kids at all, their friends are assholes, the kids get mugged by other kids on the street, there's nobody likable. But I was fascinated by the relationship between all of them, which I found like incredibly well developed and I was invested in, even though I was like, you're a bad person, you're a bad person, you're a bad person. <laughs> I agree. I was actually thinking that is a like, Blake is going to be the same. It's like everyone is an asshole on this movie. Yeah, you know, like, there's not I, one like I, one. None. I didn't want anyone to win. No? I was like, no. you should all be in pain and mystery. Yeah, I think that maybe well, two things. First, the first one is I would say is that probably the elder, the oldest song is a bit, a bit, a bit more likable than I Then Ivan, absolutely, but not likable overall. Yeah, not likable, not likable overall. You know, in an objective manner, is like you're still a piece of garbage. I mean, not a piece of garbage, but like you're not likable. Um, but overall, is like all of them. It was interesting, it was like a good proof of the script that it could be enticing, but at the same time, you are not going to like anyone. Then you're going Which to be like, yes. We kind of like the house owner in Leviathan, and we hate absolutely everyone in Loveless, except for the community that volunteers to search yeah. for the missing point, which is the single most- But you told me that it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> but but is it, if you actually tell me that like, this would never happen in Russia, it's like, it's even more interesting from the perspective that it's like, you are like portraying the only likable thing would never happen. But it's what he wants the Russian people to be. Just like, I think he wants the people to be Ivan and Andre and learn they don't need their their 
bastard dad who doesn't treat them well. But at the same time, is that you, I, I had a feeling that you could get to the point that realizing that you don't need your bastard father without seeing him die in front of you. Agreed. Yes. But would it make as good of a film? No. If you no, just like went into therapy and got some self awareness and you're like, oh, I'm strong and I'm good and I can be without him. Well, I have to say that a scene when he dies is. <laughs> It's fun. Yeah, this is like he's like just climbing, and you see like part of the head is like, are you? And then he drops. He's like, you are seeing that happening. Is like, you're seeing that it's like he's going to one of the two is going to die, like, for sure. I, even though I've seen this film before, the way the camera shows that you see the the dad kind of like disappear over the edge, but you think he. I thought the second time around. Oh no, he's hanging <laughs> on. To something. There's no way he fell off. <laughs> no, he died. No. He, yeah, it, it's well shot. It's well shot how they actually just play with that. He's like, okay, I can see that he's like probably had like some hardness or something. Well, he's Russian. Maybe he actually died shooting that scene. <laughs> they do their own stunts, no cords. It's all fine. Exactly. Yeah. It's like he just jumped, you know, from, uh, I don't know, like what? 60, 100 feet tall. It's, it's fucking scary. I'm not afraid of heights, but like when I was thinking like later, like just, just shaking, it's like, oh, 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 yeah, no, I didn't. No, no, thank you. Yeah, but uh, I had to say this, I love that this director only directed like, like five movies. It's, it's amazing. I just want to have like this. I know that we have a really like, safe where we actually talk about a director like Fastbinder. It's like 44 movies in, what, 13 years? The last one, three years, also directed like a lot of stuff so far. Haneke also directed a lot of stuff. It's like this guy, the three movies that I watched from him, that is like just more than 50% of all of his movies, are really good. They are. They're incredible. And I feel like there are probably two types of directors. And I compare this to me and my husband. My husband just likes to buy as many things as possible at a discounted price and then hopes he gets what he needs. And I research for three months about the backpack that I want and I buy it. So I think there are these directors that they have a shit ton of ideas and they just want to go, you know, explore them. And it's like Woody Allen who releases two movies a year. And then there are directors who are like, I have one idea and I'm going to perfect the shit out of this. And I'm going to release one movie every four years and make a big impact. Yep. Yeah. And I think that is like, he has a thing. He has a thing. I'm, yes. I'm so is curious. That, you do, I hope he directs something else because I want to see where he goes from here. I don't care. <laughs> see, it's like a, after seeing like his most recent movie and the first movie, is like I know where he's going. Is that whatever he does is going to be about Russia, about like how he actually failed to his people, and about like how his people has this kind of abusive relationship with him. That's yeah, it. Yeah. He may I mean, change I, I the agree. setting, he may change the characters, but is it? <laughs> I think you're right, but I also hope that he would try and pivot at some point and put his like insane amount of skill to try and express a different idea. That's not saying I dislike any of his movies, I'm not disappointed in him, but I would like to see what he, he would do if he wasn't focused on doing a commentary of a motherland. But that's the reason why I was mentioning Fassbinder everywhere. Is that Fassbinder also had like a focus idea, except Carol. Let's just leave Carol. <laughs> but it's like in the two other movies that I watched from him, is that he actually has an idea about like, look, I'm the son of a broken country. You know, and it was like one of the biggest countries in the world. And he's like, I want to criticize exactly how we handle things and how things may actually just turn into something even worse. And I feel it's like, I I feel something similar with this director. It's a bit more of a disenchantment about like what your country is and what your country could be. But, uh, so I agree with you. That's my experience with Fastbinder, but we've seen three of his 42 movies, right? So we can't really say <laughs> with Jagenza, we're like, true. we've seen three out of five. We're pretty sure what the theme is at this point. <laughs> That's true, that's true. And I think that it's like we should actually just watch the other two for just completing the whole filmography. It's like there are not so many directors that we could say that we watch every single fucking movie. <laughs> Put them on the list. What is it? Elena is one? Yeah, and the Vanishman. 
Yeah, and the I, w- I would just add it. When I'm feeling particularly masochistic and it's my choice, I'll be like, let's go back to Andre's world. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when I was watching this movie. It's like, they're not easy to watch. They are not, you know, like making you feel good or anything, or not even like as digestible or palatable as Hanukkah's movie. It's like he even like tries to remain like even more distant from it. I, would you say that's true, like comparing this to The Seventh Continent? I feel like Michael Haneke is like 5,000 miles away from those characters. He's like, we will not engage with them emotionally. <laughs> well, I think that it's like Haneke likes to have like the camera closer to the characters. And this guy is like, if I could just put it like even more farther away, you know, that it even like, just feels about like, oh, this this is not on, not even your neighbors. This is something that you have seen like a block away. It almost feels like when you're walking through the through the tenderloin and you hear like the screams, like two blocks away. Is it? I don't know if I'm going to be like seeing them or not. It's not as crude as Hanukkah. Hanukkah is going to be like, just making you see. You know, it's because of, oh, no, no, the camera is closed because I just want you to see how someone is dismembering someone else. But with this guy, it's like, you can't get a hearing sound. Yeah, you're right. Um, But I will say that I didn't connect emotionally with anyone in uh, the Seventh Continent, and I kind of understood the boys. Again, coming from a broken family, I might be projecting. (laughs) (laughs) No, I don't think that you're, I mean, you may be projecting too, but it's like I, I I agree with that. Is that I connected with the kids, but I hate both of them. Yeah, absolutely. No, I never want to see those kids again. I actually, I remember Ivan so well from this film that I thought, surely I've seen another of his movies. So I went to his IMDb page. Nope, I just remember Ivan so much because of how much I hate him. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that. It's like, this is a character that is like... He has a face also that is like, you look like an old guy, you know? Mm-hmm. You look like old enough and that it will be okay for me just to slap you. Yep, and if you look at his current IMDb photo, he looks exactly like that with a beard. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, but no, of it all, I love it. I was, I guess, enthralled by it. It was not an easy movie to watch. I watched it on several days. I didn't watch it like just a single shot, you know, but it was not easy to digest, but enjoyable overall as a cinema lover to watch. So I'll say that I agree it's not easy, but this is not a chore to watch. This is super compelling. It, it's not slow. The pacing is great. What it, what's it? What it is asking you to experience emotionally is what's not easy. I just find that, like, it's a chore to watch the second yeah. half of, of Twin Peaks. It's not a chore to watch this film. <laughs> no, and it's not a chore as watching a Hanukkah movie. That is, like, you are torturing me. You are like just getting enjoyment out of my suffering. You know, it is a bit more that like you're not getting enjoyment because I think that you are like suffering in the same way that I'm suffering. Yes. I'm displaying this on the screen. So, yeah, actually, there is, I think that he tries to find some kind of empathy. And I was asking you before the podcast about this, about like how Andre is received in Russia. You know, because it's like this, I, I just had the feeling that this is a movie message. You know, it's like his cinema tries to have like a message. It's true that like every single movie is about the same message, that is about like, open your eyes. Is that like, this is fucked up. Is that like what is happening around us? I cannot say it like explicitly, but it's pretty in between the lines. I, like, I just wonder about like if I were Russian, I would be like, would I be like just looking forward to his next movie or not? Yeah, it's really interesting because I was actually living in Russia when this movie came out, but I didn't see it until I came back to the States. Um, so were people talking friend, about it? I don't know because I, <laughs> you don't often meet anyone that like can speak about that are passionate enough about film to know who the director is, what they're trying to say, right? It's it's a pretty small group of people who are into that, um, and it never came up. I wish I had known about this film at the time and asked, but I haven't really spent time there since he's become the master that he is, well, was as of 2017 when Love Books came out. 
Well, you I just haven't done anything since Love List came out. That's the only point. Gotcha. But the funny thing is that I think that he only became. Sorry that I'm having like sort of groups. Uh, I think that he only became like a bit more focused in between doing the return and Loveless. But I don't think that he actually grew as a director, per se. You know, uh, only on that, on, on just being a bit more focused, but it's like the script actually gives you that. So it's been a while since I've seen Loveless, but from what I remember, that was a tight movie. Like, it was perfect. Every cut, the pacing, the characters, the message. Um, this one I feel like was a little bit less, like, uh, I mean, it was his first, I, I disagree with you. I think he definitely grew from The Return, which I think had some forgivable errors into Loveless, which is nearly perfect. Do you remember what was your score for Loveless? Don't check it. I'm guessing it was a nine. Yeah, it was exactly a nine. But that's so it's hard to break that nine barrier. Only Lavender. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we go over the questions? Because we have been like just talking about it and I have the that we're going to be like just getting to talking to circles at this point. Uh, would you watch this, the return again? 100%. Yeah, I actually kind of felt like asking my husband to watch it with me <laughs> again, like now. So. Okay, like two days later. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely watch it again. I think there is an amazing movie. Would you recommend it? Yes. And in fact, it was one of the first movies I made my husband sit down and watch with me. I was like, you're going to see this. <laughs> How do you feel about the movie? I don't think he liked it that much. He was nice about it because he knew I liked it a lot, but he didn't offer many opinions beyond that. Yeah. We usually talk about, like, recommend it, yes, but to whom? And it's like, this is a movie that is like, I would recommend to everyone. It's that like, there is Anyone. nothing like, to trust. Yeah. It's, like, yeah, it's, it's pretty not easy the to film's be. problem. Yes. If you don't yeah. like it, that's on you. <laughs> Well, I won't say that, but I will say that is like, I will be like really interested to hear like for example like everyone's opinion about it. You know, is that there is it's two days like something metaphorical, but is that there is a good face value that you can get out of this. You know? Perfect. So it's like I think that that's like yeah, there's like, that's perfect for recommending to everyone. It's like you get the additional value, great, otherwise it's like it's still great. Um would you remember it? Did you remember it from the last time? <laughs> Yes, uh, there was a little bit in the middle, like the road trip to the lake, but everything on the island. I didn't remember the, the very, very ending when the, the boat sinks with the dad's body, but overall, yes, I knew what this one was about. Yeah, I think that probably I will remember like parts of it. I won't remember the whole thing. I think that is, I just, as I was telling at the beginning, is that this is basically like a, a story of a abusive father that he just finds like different ways of abandoning his kids over and over through the movie. Yep. You know, so it's like, I'm not going to be like remember it all the time that he <laughs> abandons them, unfortunately. Uh, so, do you think that there is any, anything artistic about it? Um, I would say that yes, it's it's subtle in the same way that Mike Lee's direction is subtle, but his pacing is just perfect, and the shots that he clearly is a, a driving force, probably not the only driving force, but I mean, he has a vision and he makes it happen, and I got his vision, and to me that's artistic. Yeah, I would say that the that I agree with you that there is something artistic about it. I don't agree so much about the pacing. For me, it was a bit that long, a tiny bit, you know? But it's like, I think that the shots are artistic, like how he closes, that is like, okay, they're a bit artsy right now, but I appreciate it. And when he closes with the pictures that the elder brother was taking, is like, okay, they're like some of them, they're like pretty cool, and we actually saw these shots along the movie is that you could have done it a bit more artistic, but you actually decided to just make it a bit more human. And so I feel like that's, that's good that you actually just present to the audience about it. I could have gone further, like with just more beautiful shots, but I didn't because the kids and the father was the characters in this. So yeah. I appreciate it. Do you think that this is a timeless piece? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact they don't have cell phones makes it a little bit like 
positioned in time, but the themes, I mean, yeah. it's just, it's almost like mythic, the themes that are explored yeah. in here. Yeah. Almost like a great tragedy of how like you're oh, just missing oh. one of your parents and you're missing that, like, that role in your life. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Is that that's completely timeless for me. Is like the, the, the self I thought it a couple of times, but at the same time, is like, it's critical to what he's trying to tell. Probably not. Yep. So, uh, would you turn this into TV show? I'm going to be like saying it first. No. Hell no. <laughs> for me. You thought, like you thought one hour and 45 minutes was too, sl too long. Yeah, for me, well, like, this is enough time for just seeing how a father can abandon their kids. <laughs> I think one of the big, big strong points about this is that this is a very small window of time. We don't find anything out about before or after, and it, it just wouldn't work unless you dedicated like one episode per day. And I I don't need it. I don't need it for the story to be any more impactful or beautiful or no. Yep. Uh, the last question, do you think that this movie could have been better? So I wouldn't have said this before our conversation, but now it annoys me that the whole buried uh, suitcase, it annoys me more now. So yeah, I think yeah. I would take that yeah. out. As we said before, it wouldn't detract from the film at all to take that one scene out. It's just a little bit bizarre, so. Yeah, it, there is no point. You know, it, it only tries to just make the father a bit more mysterious and a bit more manipulative with the kids. But is it? Is it, is it any value? Is it, no, it's not. Is that you already have this play piece that if he doesn't really care about the kids. Is it, so why? Why adding this? So yeah, I agree that it's like that that's an arc that will have removed. And this like I think the loveless is superior because it's like way more focused. There is no fat to it, it's more lean. Yeah. You know, and this was the kind of thing is like, if you can remove that and other parts of the movie, then maybe you have been 20 minutes of this movie and it would have been way better. I get that. Yep. Uh, so, should we score this? We should. I did not check yeah. your score. So, I think that is good. So, I actually was like just dancing between two different numbers. And the reason why I was dancing across these two numbers is because I think that Loveless is better, but I scored Loveless an 8, that I regret now. I think that Loveless is an 8.5, you know, close to 9, sure. And uh, But I think that this is an 8 movie for me. All right. I, so I am glad you asked me what my... Um what my score for Loveless is because yeah, Loveless is better, but this is very, very close. And it's more like that, like edgy, authentic thing that, with hunger and Steve McQueen, right? It's imperfect, but it's passionate and I like it. Um, so I'm giving it an 8.5. Oh, yep. That sounds good. So uh, for next time, going back to my previous movie that it was Frank, when talking about it, I was thinking that it's funny to see movies that the main character doesn't show the face for most of the movie and how he tries to convey his feelings through it. And I wanted to request this movie that I really liked when I went to the cinema to watch, but I felt like a hipster because it's an A24 movie. Uh, but I want to force you to watch it. That is a ghost story. That is my favorite Kate the Affleck movie ever. There is no harm because the other one that I was with him, it was my What about Ocean's 13? I never watched it. I stopped at Ocean's 11. <laughs> Well, I uh, I felt the same about uh, the same as you when that film came out, and I did not go see it because I was like, eh, this is a little too on the nose. I but I really Leo. wanted to see it, so I'm happy you're like quote unquote forcing me. Uh, cool. Uh, anything else to say about the tour? Just one more question. You know, Tarkovsky was obsessed with plants and water. It, uh, obsessed with water in general. Did you get any nods towards mm -hmm. Tarkovsky in this film? 
Well, I mean, I got enough about like just being obsessed with water. When they go to an island and they are like these pretty shots of water, there is actually a point that I felt like a bit peace about it. That uh, the kids at the end, when the boat sinks, they are in front of a green screen. Oh, just really? making it a bit more lively. Oh. It's pretty clear. Yeah. And I feel it's like, oh, okay. You really want to emphasize the water as some kind of fluidity here. But come on. It's like you haven't used any other like green screens across the whole movie. Like, well, I'm, glad that you, um, I'm glad that you got that because I was like, I know like five Russian directors. So am I only saying it's like Tarkovsky because it's a Russian who also liked water? So, all right, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I didn't actually like connect him directly. You know, I feel it. Like, okay, both of them are, are fine with the slow pace. They are like uncompromising from their perspective. It's the policy shit. I like a stalker, but there are like some scenes in a stalker that is like, just move this thing forward for the love of God. Just move it. I mean, this movie, I felt the same way. There, is, there are a couple of scenes that is like, okay, I get it. I get it. He's going to be like abandoned. The kid is abandoned. Please just come back. He said, we know that he's going to come back. All right. Well, that's all I had. <laughs> okay. And to those five people that are out there, thank you so much for listening to us. Wash your hands. <laughs>